I, I, I love the Pacific. I've, I've had the privilege of um, being able to travel uh, quite a bit when I was younger mm -hmm. with my parents and being able to see the world. And when I compare it all that I've seen back to where I was raised, I'm really, yeah. I'm really quite lucky, especially with um, where I am in New Zealand now. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first inaugural PlungeCast. What is PlungeCast? Well, PlungeCast is a build-up of years of just messing around with podcasts, talking to people, interviewing people, because I quite enjoy doing that, uh, getting to know about the background, and actually spending some good quality time with them about what they're about and their backgrounds, uh, how they see the world, how they see themselves, how they see their art, and how they see the future and where they're going and so today with me on plunge cast the first ever one is uh quarter chepru uh from from right here and we'll i'll let him introduce himself and a bit of a bio background and we'll take it away from there after he's finished hi yeah um well i'm i'm quarter uh i've been uh, it's a bit of a strange name. I'm French, but I was raised in New Zealand and I've been here since 2006. I did all my schooling in English and I'm a certified Kiwi. Um, yeah, I've just, uh, oh, what, what, what do I say? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm an artist. I love, I've always loved drawing and comic books and fantasy world and design and that sort of thing and thank you for having me on plunge uh especially for the first episode i'm really really excited looking forward to this awesome all right so where did you live in france right so, so actually I mean, like, it's so yeah. far away from new zealand in the sense that we all we know about it is like the this the the lead it, no, that's Italy, isn't it? Lenny Pisa, Tower Pisa yeah, and all that. That's, but we know it for the wine country, we know for the champagne, uh, we know it for the the romanticness of it all. You know, is it is it the Eiffel Tower? Because I get confused with it too. It's Eiffel Tower, isn't it? Yeah, Eiffel Tower is the one in France. Um, now, funny, I'm Basically. actually yeah. Both both my parents are French, but I was uh, I was actually raised in Vanuatu for five years that's where oh, my wow. parents met uh i was born in new zealand but yeah i had my childhood in vanuatu and and then yeah moved here so I've, I've been to france a few times of course that's where all my extended family is from but i haven't actually lived in france I'm more of a so i'm a i guess i'm a proper kiwi so yeah yeah you're like you you're you're a tourist like me from fiji uh, you know born raised in fiji I was in seven or something and eight and then suddenly i'm transplanted here which yeah. i think is the best thing that could have happened to me right but i mean like being oh. an island boy right vanuatu being an island boy tell us a bit about that it was um it's awesome i i, I love the pacific i've i've had the privilege of um being able to travel uh, quite a bit when i was younger mm -hmm. with my parents and being able to see the world and when I compare it all that I've seen back to where I was raised, I'm really, yeah. I'm really quite lucky, especially with um, where I am in New Zealand now. Like, shit, this yeah. really is paradise, and you know, I, yeah. I love the culture, Pacifica cultures, um, Pacifica people. I've always, I really feel at home here, and the people, everyone has always welcomed me as as if I'm one of them. So I'm, I'm really grateful yeah. for that, and loving it there is a there is a uh there's something about being a migrant um that that people that who aren't right don't understand the appreciation and the gratitude we have for being in a country that's not our own as such i mean yeah. we become citizens permanent residents and all that that says that we are kiwis now because we've been here for so long but there's still that uh that I, I, misunderstanding where that you you know people don't understand that how grateful you are when you realize that you've come from an from something that could almost be classed as a third world country you know in the pacific there's some things that you don't have until i mean like i was talking to somebody on uh an american from utah on the bus the other week coming back 
you know, from um, coming back up from Auckland. And I just turned to them, and they were from America. Right? They, oh, we hate America. I'm like, you guys are so free. Which, what I meant by free was that you guys have so much things freely at your hand, at your fingertips, right? You, you, you know, we didn't have, um, I, I, if I remember right about Fiji, we didn't have running water until like about the 90s. You know, and or the late eighties. I don't remember that happening. When did you guys have like you know running water in, uh, in Vanuatu? Oh, I think oh, I, I was really quite young, so I didn't I didn't know all about the infrastructure. But I know like one big shock for me was the technological gap. Like yeah, in Vanuatu, you know, didn't really have internet. All the telephones were still the big giant bricks with the antennas, and then yeah. we come to New Zealand and. Even in New Zealand, of course, we were living rurally, so I got to live with dial-up and, and that sort of stuff, despite yeah. my generation being essentially the first generation that gets to live with it. So I still got to see it, essentially, what came just before the prime where we're at now. But, um, yeah, I think that was probably the biggest thing is just the technology. Um, I went back, of course, uh, oh, it must be a couple of years ago now, uh, to Vanuatu and seeing how it changed in like the 10 year gap, like yeah. with the advertisements everywhere, like it used to really just yeah. be rural country islands, almost like yeah. an un paradise that's just developing. And now it's like mm. this weird metropolitan, like you've got billboards for ads, everyone's carrying a little telephone um, yep. and yeah, I guess I guess that was yeah probably just the main thing is probably the technology. Um, I was too young to really notice anything else like infrastructure, but yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm talking about phones. I went to Fiji in about 2000 uh, to get married and stuff, and um, I noticed all my cousins like posing with phones with their mobile phones. Yeah. Right. Uh, it was just a generation earlier than what we had here. But they were just posing with the phones, and for us, it was just normal. In New Zealand, it was just just a phone by now, right? Because I'd been I'd had a phone for about three, four years, maybe three mm. years by that time, and um, so it wasn't a big deal to me. But seeing it in Fiji, it was really, really strange that it was like the fashion statement to have. It's like, look at my phone, I have the phone, and it was quite weird. Like, you know, it's it's like posing with your baby. Look, my baby. You know, it was funny. And I, I thought that was quite interesting in the sense that, like, there is a cultural divide because of the generation um, in technology. But there's also, like, in Fiji, like, they had a, when they started putting t New Zealand TV in Fiji, they had an uptick in pregnancy amongst the teenagers because of Shortland Street. Oh, so, really? Uh, once Shortland Street, yeah, once Shortland Street hit Fiji, there was all this whole uptick in uh, teen pregnancy that the government realized was happening. And they had to so, sort of, deal with that all of a sudden that wasn't there before yeah the big giant not to say there wasn't yeah not to say there wasn't any teenage pregnancies before but not to that high level where they actually went well what's going on here something's up and it's like ah that's when it started because that's when we got this and now we got this what was it like living in Vanuatu it was it was pretty cool it was um Vanuatu is a very unique um country because it was colonized by two powers by the english and the french so mm. um of course there was like two different schools there was the french school and the english school and i of course yeah. I, I was too young so i was basically in kindergarten but in the french kindergarten and and of course there's the french embassy mm. and the so there was like yeah this duality between well not really a duality yeah. because there was of course the french side the, the french powers the english powers and then the native people, the ones that um, the ones that had the land, the ones that were doing most of the jobs. And it yeah. was a, a lot of my observation from Vanuatu comes like at a later date, because, of course, when I was too young, you know, I'd, just a kid, you, you just take so everyone and yeah, you just have fun yeah. and cry when you fall over and that sort of stuff. But yeah, um, yeah it's. It's really quite a unique um, country. It's got its independence now for a, for a couple of years. I don't know the exact date, but it's yeah. It's definitely it definitely feels like a whole other world compared to where I'm at now and and other places I've seen. 
So it's quite unique in that way. Yeah, it's kind of like Fiji as well. I mean, Fiji got its um, independence in the 1970s, I think it mm. was, early 1970s, and just before I was born. And so, you know, I wouldn't have seen that huge amount of um, Europeans there just because it was just after I was born. I um, mean, yeah. before I was born, sorry. So, but like, I went, you know, I went to school in Fiji. Uh, I come from a village, small village. Um, watching it modernize, right? My, my little village modernized. It really cracks me up. Um, you know, within like about 30 odd years, you know, you've got a resort on the back island, you know, the, on the little backyard, basically, you know, five minutes away from my home, 10 minutes by, by car. There's a um, resort there now, you know. And the good thing is that that's economy and um, for the local community because of that, where you can have like, um, you know, a couple of my cousins or my uncle and my extended relations work have worked there because it's so close to home. And, you know, and then also all the other, you know, Denaral with the risks, basically, you know, Whitfield, uh, uh, Hilton and all that's there now uh, and Nandy. And you kind of, you know, we, we haven't like, I think unlike Vanuatu, Fiji has been very modern for quite a while because of that. But that doesn't mean the economies, like the local people are very rich, you know, and... Um, um, yeah, not at all. There, there's a huge, there's still a very obvious divide between, you know, of course, the the locals, the natives, and um, the expatriates, those that come from overseas with these qualifications and get these higher landing jobs and then buy these big properties and big concrete houses and then, yeah, 20 minutes down the road, you still got people living in, in the corrugated roofs and the thatch and... Shanty. Yeah, yeah, the little, the little shacks, and yep. and you still have these little isolated areas where you know people people stick to the traditions to to the way they were raised. Yeah, it's quite, it is quite interesting when you have some little, like the uh, you know colonized islands, you know, and stuff, because you kind of you know your modern outlook is like, how does that make sense? But then I've also seen expats come back and you know like indian expats come back fijian expat come back and actually do well and actually create a healthy economy because of that like i've seen one shot a uh, one person come in and to our village from australia who had from been from our village and decided you know what people need ice here and frozen mm. ice, uh, frozen chickens right so and cold beer and he made a whole, made, bought a store. That's all he did. Now there is a, um, a huge, like, well, I'd say like a countdown size store, grow, oh, just yeah. on that, yeah, supermarket. on property. Yeah, a supermarket that just up the road from where he was. And then this is all because of just ice, because it's hot, right? Cold beer and, uh, and frozen chicken, three things that made it work. And he's been able to, um, you know, there's a whole economy that became because of it. Like there's, uh, there's um, before there was swampland, well, almost like swampland, like low um, rice paddy, you know, that would get washed out and so on. Mm. And now there's just homes there, like just homes on both sides because that one store. Not a, And so now people can actually work in the store. Now they can actually, they don't have to pay uh, bus fare or taxi to go to town right so there's that whole thing's cut out now that expense yeah. is cut out now and so now there's more money in the pocket and so now you can just buy from there and come here for uh yeah three minute walk home three minute walk home not five dollars on a taxi or two dollars return fare and something like that it all costs when you're not on a high income you know and was it like what's it what's it like that in that sort of way, in um, Vanuatu, is you know, the, is that kind of like the costs of did the, the expats come back and try to work in it, or was it just people like from France and um, you know England coming back and going, okay, like you said, got the degrees, now I'm just going to do it for myself. Whereas this was different. Like this is about actual how do we fix this economy and supply the chain direct, you know? Yeah, I'm. Um... I've got to be honest, I'm, I don't really have too much knowledge on that sort of field. It's It has been years since I've been there and 
and I haven't been able to, you know, clearly witness the changes that um, obviously do happen. And I'm sure, um, I don't doubt it, that of course people um, would go overseas and come back to for the benefit of their own home. That's, you know, that's yep. a big dream for a lot of people is improving where you come from. And um, yeah, uh, I'm sure it happens, but yeah, I personally don't, I don't know exactly mm. what would have happened or what has developed. I do know um, when we did go back a couple years, um, this this one road along the lagoon that used to be, you know, just a road, there was nothing on the side of the road. Now there was turned into a big port where all the cruise ships would come in. So there were all these like temporary yep. stalls for all the tourists. And yeah, uh, of yep. course the locals would go there and try to sell, make their own little business and make some money off the people mm. coming to visit. So that was a big thing is yeah seeing that that long drive that used to just be wilderness is now almost like a an extended market all along one road yeah that leads then into the city and the other way to the to the harbor so yeah yeah it's kind of like a cottage industry where you know like it's popping up because of that uh the extra business i want i wonder like um you know, it's 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 kind of weird. Like, I mean, like having the view, like, of, of because of being um, from from the islands and then going back after several times over, you know, like every ten five years and seeing the yeah. changes is, you know, for me it amazes me about how you know um, how it works and how how society can change. But if you can't, if you for, push it on 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 you know on a local economy really quickly you know it could topple over quite fast but if you watch it goes slowly and over time people are able to grow with it and become more acceptable it's it's easier to you know to actually decide what sells what doesn't sell and you know and you now you're building a cottage industry around it did you like when was the last time you got over i think it would have been 2000 and 13 2014 i was in my last year of intermediate and okay. and yeah we went to go back and see some family and friends so that would have been i think six or seven years after i'd left i went back and seen it and it's been yeah it's already been seven years now since so i'm, I'm due for another visit i need to go back and see how it's changed again but yeah i'm, I'm sure you'll be amazed uh, hopefully it, it'll be for the better, you know, because uh, that's one thing I always think like, is it for the better or is it for the worse when it, when, when you sort of like have those changes happen. Now you said you moved over in 2006. Now, how did that happen? Like who decided that this was going to be your thing? And I mean, for the family. So, um, I was, I was born in New Zealand because of, um, the yeah. hospital and health. Uh, things that we had in Vanuatu couldn't really support um, complicated births. And so mum and dad okay. flew over to New Zealand, stayed with family friends here. And I was born here, went back. But my sister had, uh, my half sister had finished uh, essentially high school over there. And she was looking to continue for college. And so she had two, op two opportunities to go to Australia or to go to New Zealand. And yeah her father being from new zealand she was like well i'm, I'm gonna go to new zealand i have a couple of friends there that are also going there and that mm -hmm. was when my mom and dad were like yeah well maybe we should make the move as well make you know move away from that life and and start yeah. something new buy buy property and build our house and so we we That's sailed cool. over here because my dad's a my dad's a skipper a sailor and a boat boat builder awesome. So we sailed here on our on our boat, arrived in yeah, like early two thousand and six, had my sixth birthday in New Zealand. We did a couple of trips back and forth, like when I was like four or five. Um, yeah. But then yeah, we moved here and then I started my primary education and in Fangarei we got a plot of land, just a random paddock, built a barn, moved into there. And yep. then built our house while that was Wait. under construction. 
whereabouts did you land? Like, I mean, what, did you just go, we're going to go like Fung Ray, right? Mum and Dad go, yeah. Fung Ray is where we're going to go. Like, this is not the first place everybody comes to the size. It's like Auckland, right? Or Wellington is yeah. where we're going to go. The city. Uh, why, was, um, you know, what made you come to Fung Ray? So, so my sister was, of course, going to university at, at Auckland. Um, right. And my dad had experience. Like, he lived in Auckland a couple of years um, as a seasonal thing with his job. So he had experience of Auckland. And yeah, my parents, um, of course, left France because they, they wanted to escape the city, the big thing. That's why they came to the islands, to the Pacific. Yeah. And so with my sister studying in Auckland, they decided, you know, hey, let's, we want, obviously we want to be near Auckland, but we don't want to be in Auckland. What's, right. What are the other options? And we looked around, uh, I think Hamilton was a consideration, but it wasn't really a coastal town. And my dad obviously wanted yeah, to work. Yeah, we're going to park the boats. Yeah, we're going to park the boat and we're going to get a job as a skipper in, in Hamilton. It's like inland. Yeah. So um, yeah. I think, yeah, it just naturally devolved to um to just going a little bit more north into the subtropical area the north island here in northland and yeah. um yeah we arrived in fungi day and my parents were like wow yeah this is this is yeah. this is nice we can we can work with this and of course yeah. fungi day has even changed so much since then with the new bridge yeah. the town getting remodeled and everything and so yeah we were at the fungi day marina and then out on the piles and then we bought our piece of land and then we were between the boat and the land and yep. eventually moved to fully being on the land and having our house. Awesome. So your primary school, your college, I guess because you're from the islands and because you you got French blood, what was it like as being like, you know, the new kid in town, you know, <laughs> It was um it was funny because when I first started school in New Zealand, I actually did not know a word of English. I did wow. not know anything. I was speaking only French at home and with my parents. And first first day in school, and everyone's you know, oh, what's your name? What's your name? What's your name? And, and I you're like what? <laughs> yeah, I can't reply. So I go home and I'm like, yeah, everyone asked me this thing. What's your name? What does that mean? And they're like, oh, it's yeah, what that belt you? And I'm like, oh. Oh, okay. Yeah. Of course, I, you know, you're still adapting. So my default used to be just pointing at my cubby hole with my little name tag and be like, this. Even if someone was yeah. like, hey, can you pass me a pencil? I'll just be like, didn't know. But that's, apparently, see, that's, like, another thing that, that's another thing that people don't understand. I like, I, I spent so many years in l reading classes, like up to form five. I was in special ed reading classes. And, you know, when you're when you when you're a First Nation English speaker, right? Um, you know, especially if you come from a European country, and your main language, right? Even though we have bicultural here, it, it's still the com main communication language is English, mm. and like Fiji, it is too. Uh, like it's not the main language, but the between like the cultures, there's a English, right? So the yeah. in Indians who uh, will speak Fiji. Uh, uh, English to Fijians and so forth. So there's a little bit of communication, but also they'll each other will know a bit of Hindi as well, or mm. or Fijian, like native Fijian tongue. And so there was that communication between them. But when you're like, when you know nothing, right? I don't even remember if I knew how much I knew because I know it was easier for me but somehow. But I still had to get special ed reading classes to actually learn how to read, learn how to spell. You know, up to form five, man, I had the principal's wife teaching me in high school, right? You know, it's, you know, it's like, hey, it's time for you for that. And I'm like, okay. Didn't know it was a special ed reading class until years later, you yeah. know, because that's how bad my, you know, and I still have trouble with grammar. I don't know where to put the comma. Uh, and, you know, it, it, even though I'm a writer, right, I'm writing tons and tons of stuff all the time. Yeah. I still have problem with my grammar because that's one thing I couldn't figure out um, and work with. But so as someone like no idea how to speak English, how long did it take for you to actually, you know, get comfortable 
around because that can be a horrible barrier, right? It's a wall yeah, when you can't but, speak the um, language of the native people, basically. It definitely was um, a, a big shock and a big thing to get used to. But I, I was quite lucky because I was so young. I really caught on quite quickly. Like my parents, yeah. they love telling me that apparently like one or like a month, a month and a couple of weeks, maybe like eight, six, mm. or, six or eight weeks. I was already speaking fluent English just because I was purely yep. surrounded by it. That's that's yep. all I had. And I just, you know, you have to adapt and you learn bit by bit, like, oh, this word means that. And this is how you, yep. like, for so long, same, I took um, ESOL, which was English learning support, something like that. And yeah. I had a big so problem English is with... second language. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think it's English, second language, something like that. But yeah, it's a special so, class um, again, right? Yeah, yeah, I had to go through that. I had to go through the whole, um, like, rearranging my sentences because in French, essentially, it's, like, swapped away and it's, like, um, your subject first and then your your adjectives and all that and English. So, And that still, that still kind of affects me today. It's in the same in my writing where I have to get so many people to proofread it because they're like, wow, your sentences are just all over the place. They're just mixed up and it's because my brain works in these two languages where um of course sometimes it starts to merge both of them which at home it's perfect it's cool but yeah because dealing, your parents understand what you're saying yeah when you're dealing with people that you know only speak in one specific language uh it can become a bit of a barrier just because yeah uh the misunderstanding but that's you know with time you've gotten much better at it and yeah, I did all my schooling in English, so now it feels like English is my primary language, even though I still struggle with it sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it is interesting. I'm like, that's the same as me, right? Like, I mean, coming over around about seven, eight, and having to just adapt. That's the thing that, like, I, I find it really strange nowadays when I find that people don't like to adapt, migrants mm. especially, when they choose not to adapt. It's like, how do you expect the people to actually – to react um, you, not to not you, yeah. yeah, yeah. If you don't adapt to, to your to the local, uh, you know, citizenry, how do you expect them to respect you? Because you're actually putting up a wall that you don't want. You yourself don't want to cross over. It's not their fault. It's you yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to cross over to shake the hand and go, "Hey, we're here. We'd like to be a part of you, and will you accept us?" Right? And basically, you know, the the otherwise you're just a tourist and nobody's going to respect a tourist you're just here to get for, for us to get money off you right that's it you're yeah, going to buy our stuff and, and we, we can go yeah and it's it's really i find it like sometimes when i see that in the news and stuff and i'll kind of go well it's your own fault for not adapting in a sense because like you have a choice to like say you moved here nobody forced mm -hmm. you to come right and, yeah. and so if you if you moved here and nobody forced you to come of, and you came of your own cognizance because you decide this is the place you want to live if you want to live here be a part of it do something for as as part of the community be uh you know adapt full on go on full on and you'll notice that people who do that are so loved by the community right and people who don't they're always like stay at arm's length because they're like they they always get suspicious about us and we get suspicious about them and i mean like the tourists right because like yeah. the migrant because if if you can't if there is no like um involvement in the community that means you're just you're just you know you're just here for a holiday and you're treating us like like uh you know uh you just take advantage of what we have to offer and i find that quite offensive at times i, I had to deal with it deal with that all the time with myself I'm like why is my community doing that in the sense like why are the indian community treating new zealand like a freaking holiday space but they're the ones who came to move and live here you know i'm like yeah. especially after 40 years of being here i'm like dude i've seen the changes i've seen the amazing way this country has treated me all the benefits i've gotten and i keep getting right yeah. as a migrant and even though i'm a citizen now and all that i still you know i'm here and people know that i'm not from here right away right because yeah. but you know and you're kind of like well how do 
how do I get other people to realize that if you keep keep the keep the locals at arm's length, you're only hurting yourself, you're hurting your kids, you're hurting their kids in the future because you're not involving yourself in the community.